Hi, I'm Herm Gilly here on a sunny, windy day to talk about the horse of a lifetime. You know, there's a saying that every horseman or horsewoman in their life gets one really great horse. And I was lucky enough to have mine early on. And I know some of us get more than one, but there's always one that we remember. Can't get them out of our head, they were special. If you've had one, shoot us a comment. We'd love to hear about it. I'm sure the other people who watch your channel would like to hear about yours and maybe they could share theirs as well. And if you're waiting for one, let us know what it is you're looking for, what you're waiting for, and we will all hope you get it. So I was lucky enough to get my horse of a lifetime early on. And while you could say other things thereafter, other horses might be a bit of a letdown perhaps, that's not really true. It just gave me a benchmark, a standard to measure other horses against. And I just haven't ever found another one that was just quite the same. Though I've had probably a couple hundred horses in my lifetime and worked with, with many more. So we go back in time. I was 19 years old. It's 1971. It's the spring quarter horse sale at Timonium, Maryland, run by my friend Mike Jennings. Uh, still doing horse sales today. And I was there and along with me was my friend Charlie Dixon. Now I was pushing 20 and Charlie was pushing 40. But we were really pretty good friends. Straight up friends. Not just an older guy looking out for a younger guy. Uh, just a, a, a good friendship. And we made kind of a deal that we'd split up and He'd find the horse that suited him best, and I'd find the horse that suited me best, and we'd sort of compare notes. So I saw Charlie walking down the alleyway, and I'd found my horse, and he walks over and looks into the stall. And I said, I believe this horse here is, 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 is one of the really good ones. Now, he was a big rangy gray horse. I don't have a picture of him. I don't know where they went. I don't need one, because his image is burned in my heart as deep as the Circle A brand that was burned on his left hip. He was a horse out of Texas. He was by a world champion running horse and out of a daughter of Hollywood gold. And that's, that's some old good blood. And I'd seen him ride him a little bit and I'd looked at him in the stall and I liked him. And I said, that's my choice, Charlie. Let's go look at yours. And Charlie said, we don't have to go anywhere. I've already seen him. So uh, the 40-year-old and the 20-year-old had picked the same horse. And I said to Charlie, well, we can't be bidden against each other. He said to me, no, we won't be. He said, you found him. You go ahead and buy him. So the sale comes up, and I had saved up. You know, I'm 19, and money was worth a little bit more in 1971. I had $500 I could spend. So I bid him up to the 500, and I knew I could come up with some more if I had to, but I thought, no, that's what I was gonna spend, so I, I quit. Charlie looks at me and says, are you done? I said, yeah, I'm done. He bought him for 600 American dollars. And it became immediately apparent that that was the buy of the century, at least the last century, because he was a lot more horse than what either of us ever anticipated. For a big horse, he was handy. He'd cut a cow. He'd go win a ranin. In a few weeks, he could beat most barrel horses, and by the end of the summer, he was beating all of them. We had sort of an uncivilized polo league going at that point, cowboy polo. He was a standout in that. You could pony a colt. Uh, you name it, this horse would do it, and he always tried hard, never quit, and didn't know the meaning of the word no. He just did what he was asked and delivered. And he caused a little bit of a stir and, and people offered Charlie a fair amount of money. He was offered $3,500 for the horse, which was a ton of money at that time. And he wouldn't sell it. But time came, Charlie decided to move west, which I think a lot of sensible people have done. And so he headed for Oklahoma and he decided he was gonna take very few horses with him. Didn't make sense to him to be moving horses to the horse capital of the world out in, in Texas, Oklahoma. 
he was only going to take a couple, and I, I thought for sure he'd take the big gray horse. But it came to be known he wasn't. And I thought, boy, I wish I could afford him, but I can't. So I was at Charlie's house, and he calls me aside. He said, I need to talk to you about that gray horse. I said, yeah. He said, you need to buy him. I said, I'd love to buy him, but I can't afford him. And he says, God damn it, Herm. You should have bought him for the $600 then. You learned your lesson. Will you pay me $600 for him now? Now, that had nothing to do with business. That was a lesson in friendship. There was another piece to it, though. At that time, Charlie was starting a ton of young horses, and we lived pretty close to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds here, and there was a bunch of young guys there in the military who came from out west, and Charlie got acquainted with them, and you know, he'd buy them a case of beer, and they'd come out and help him ride these colts. And they'd also take part in our polo games. So one afternoon, after we had been on a pretty long trail ride, we were batting the ball around and got pretty spirited and Charlie's horse that he was riding pitched his head up because he had given the good gray horse to somebody else to ride because that was how he was. His horse pitched his head up and hit Charlie in the face and busted out all his front teeth. And he went into the house bleeding and, you know, trying to get things put together. And these other guys, they, they sort of disappointed me. They just took these hot horses and pitched them in stalls sides heaving and I, I couldn't take care of all of them but I knew damn well I was going to take care of that gray horse so I got him out and I walked him cool and I hosed him off rinsed him off and as he dried I slipped up on his back to just walk him around the the barn there and I picked up on the halter rope and just moved it over and he stepped across himself just like he was fresh just like he had no inkling that he had had a big hard day. He was right there. And I said to him in my mind, I said, if I ever have a horse as good as you, I will take care of him for his whole life. So when Charlie offered me the horse for $600, he said, you know, I know what, what you did that night. And that meant something to me, and you deserve to have this horse. And I don't know that I've ever told that story before, but it gave me a lesson in friendship, and it was all because of that gray horse. So, you know, I could talk about what he did as a show horse and so on, but it tells you less than things like that and a few other episodes in his life that made him the horse of a lifetime. And time came a few years later, it was, you know, it was my plan to get married. And I asked my wife, who is still my wife, to marry me, and uh, she said yes, and I didn't have an engagement ring. So I gave her a big gray horse. And maybe that was the start of my attempt to be as good a husband as I could be. And again, thanks to that big, that big rangy gray horse that my wife rode the rest of his working life. Another thing that comes to mind is just the integrity of certain animals like, like this one. My dad, was working around the farm. He was in his shed fixing a feeder and the big old gray horse was in there just sort of supervising and we had a mare that was just ugly disposition. She was a good riding horse but ugly around other horses. And she saw my dad in there at the feeder. She assumed there was feed involved. She came back and in there firing both hind legs at the gray horse who turned and my dad stepped into the corner and the gray horse was right there in the corner on top of him. And this mare is just pounding that, that, that gray horse. And my dad put his hands on it. And the logical thing for that horse to do would have been to turn into that corner, 
and he could have escaped, but my dad was in there. He felt that hand on him. And that horse stood there and took it until that mare ran out of steam, rather than hurt my dad. Now my father was a doctor. He's a busy guy. Typically he would get the, he was at that point one of the senior surgeons and he would against type take the earliest operating room time he could get because he figured the team would be fresh, he'd be fresh and he'd get done a little earlier and he'd get back to the farm. If he was going into the OR at, three, at, 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 at six o'clock in the morning, he made a point that big horse was banged up some, not, nothing bad, but he had a lot of bark off of him. Every morning before he went to work, he would go out and doctor that horse. And every night when he came home, he'd look in on him and do that, and he would not let me touch him. He said, this one's on me. I'm going to see to it this horse gets through this just fine. And he did. And you know, maybe that taught me something about what you owe an animal like that. And maybe it taught me a little something about the kind of the kind of example you'd like to give as a father. And my dad said to me, that's your horse, but you do not sell him. He is dying on this place. And sadly, my, my dad died before the horse did. But I took him along with me when we moved here, and I promised him all those years ago that if I ever had a horse as good as him, I would take good care of him the rest of his life. He died at 30 and he's buried behind those trees, which is why we're doing the video out here. So, that's my horse of a lifetime. And it ends up being about so much more than horses. A horse like that can make you a better person, maybe make you a better husband, maybe teach you a different set of values than you can get from a human. You know, a good horse will win you a horse show. A good horse will make you a living. But a great horse will make you a life. And that's the horse of a lifetime. Till next time.